planning to practice as well as do the arbitration. We can only wish him all the best for all these endeavors. And Thank we you. Know that all his the previous two innings have been very successful, and he has created his indelible mark in all these affairs. And we know that while he came on platform, his sessions on various aspects have been well received. And as we were discussing the various sessions while I was congratulating him after debating the office by playing such a wonderful innings as they say in cricket, wherein the lawyers and the judiciary received his judgments as they were well received on account of the fact it covered various aspects of law, the nitty of the same were well received. And we were also receiving the messages to the effect that we should have certain sessions on the procedural law to understand. Therefore, we kept the topic for today, which deals with the procedural law, but then at the same time coming from a person who has seen as a lawyer, as well as a, a judge, what could be the fallacies while we prepare the suits for injunctions and what are the essentials for pleadings? We, we won't delve much into the legal jargons, that is the judgments as such, but yes, what should be kept in mind, juxtaposed with the judgments would be there. So. The topic from the novel times would be slightly short so that we can have Q&A as a lawyer or a student of law would try to understand what could be the essentials which should be kept while pleading the suits for injunctions. And there are various aspects in the injunctions. What are the aspects to be taken into consideration? These all issues will be taken from by the Justice Hari Prashad, a former judge from Kerala High Court. And we again welcome him for the third innings of his life which we know that he will create more indelible mark. As they say that there's a famous song, Party to Abhishuru Huya, we say that for him, the life should begin right now. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Vikas, for the kind words. And uh, thank you very much for your this introductory remarks. Now, actually, the topic that we are going to deal with today, that is injunction. It's a, a very familiar subject for lawyers, and especially I'll try to put it uh, from the perspective of you for the benefit of junior lawyers or from the perspective of a beginner of this thing. And I find some senior faces there. Uh, uh, of course, uh, it may be slightly fundamental for them if I go uh, a bit, what do you call it, in a lighter vein in this subject. So, as you know, injunction, as per the definition in Black's Law Dictionary, is an order passed by a court commanding or preventing an action. It's a mandatory direction or either it can be in the form of commanding or preventing some something be some some illegality being done. So that is injunction. And uh, as I just make some introductory remarks about uh, injunction and then I'll go to the nitty gritties of pleadings later. No, it is undoubtedly an action in persona. Injunction is an action in persona. It can't be done in gross. Injunction has also been defined as a writ framed according to the circumstances of the case. Depending on the facts and circumstances in the case, you have to frame the injunction relief in such a manner to, uh, to prevent a wrong being done. Then the main considerations while determining or deciding the rights of parties in a suit for injunction is justice, equity, and good conscience. Apart from law, the equitable principles also play an important role in the adjudication of injunction suits. So these are some fundamentals. Now we will look into some different types of injunctions possible before going, in, before going into or delving into other aspects. Let us just have a basic idea about that. Now, there is an injunction called, there is a type of injunctions called affirmative injunctions that we, uh, in the Specific Relief Act 1963, we call the mandatory injunction, affirmative injunction. And of course, you know the prohibitory injunction, preventing someone from doing something which may injure the other person is called prohibitory injunction. Then, anti-suit injunction, that's another kind of injunction where an injunction is sought prohibiting a litigant from instituting other related litigation, usually between the same parties on the same issues. So anti-suit injunction is an injunction which prevents the other party from filing a suit in respect of the same issues pending in one suit. Now that is another type of injunction possible. Then 
then uh, as you are aware uh, injunction relief or the, the 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 request for injunction relief before a court is a quatimat action that is this to prevent something hastily preventing something quatimat action now that is called that is why it is called quatimat injunctions an injunction granted to prevent an action that has been threatened but not yet violated the plaintiff's rights no once it is violated it can't be called a quatimat action but when there is a threat of being violated then you can approach the court that is called a quatimat injunction then uh, reparative injunction that is another kind of injunction possible that is to some extent that can be called as mandatory injunction but other forms are also possible anyway that's another class in the classification of injunctions you will find reparative injunction as one type of injunction that which whereby uh, the the defendant will be directed to restore the position that the plaintiff occupied prior to the commission of the wrong it's a kind of a restoration of the plaintiff situation before the wrong was committed on him that is called reparative injunction so just to uh, just to sum up this aspect there can be different types of injunctions affirmative injunction and one form is mandatory injunction and the prohibitory injunction that we know permanent prohibitory injunction then anti suit injunction quatimat injunction reparative injunction uh, and uh, you know these are the different kinds of injunctions possible the list is not exhaustive but i just wanted to tell you that these things are possible in law <clears throat> all of us are aware that prohibitory injunction forbids or restrains an illegal act that is used for forbidding or restraining an illegal act whereas mandatory injunction orders an affirmative act or mandates a specified course of conduct you are asked to do certain thing in the case of prohibitory injunction you are prevented from doing certain things so one is the converse of the other so it is uh, uh, it is a statutorily established fact that in the case of permanent reliefs of injunction you have to refer to the specific relief act 1963 because uh, the part uh, uh, part 3 dealing with preventive relief and uh, uh, there are chapters 7 8 Ah, oh, sorry. Seven and eight are the chapters falling within this part of preventive relief, dispensing relief act. So, starting from section thirty-six to forty-two, you will find the principles relating to permanent prohibitory injunction and as well as mandatory injunction decree. Then, for temporary injunction reliefs, you will have to refer to Order thirty-nine of the Code of Civil Procedure, nineteen ninety-eight, where the temporary injunction reliefs are dealt with. and the substantive provision in the cpc relating to a grant of temporary injunction you will find supplementary proceedings dealt with in section 94 so uh, uh, section uh, order 39 cpc read with section 94 cpc you will get the principles relating to the grant of temporary injunctions now come so these are the basic things about i, I just wanted to take you to the fundamentals relating to the law of injunction then coming to the rules of pleadings as you are all aware the rules of pleadings are regulated in order 6 order 7 and order 8 of the cpc and as in any other case the rules relating to pleadings will have to be observed for example order 6 uh, Order six, rule two says that uh, every pleading shall contain and contain only. See the usage because it is very very positive in expression, very affirmative. Every pleading shall contain and contain only a statement in concise form of the material facts on which the party pleading relies for his claim or defence, as the case may be, but not the evidence by which they are to be proved. so this is a fundamental principle relating to all suits which is applicable to injunction suits as well so you have to suppose no we will go to the different kinds of injunctions possible uh, this uh, uh, perceivable that we will discuss later now assume this is suit for injunction uh, by a person in possession of immobile property apprehending danger of being dispossessed or somebody threatens that he will be dispossessed suppose he wants to uh, keep his possession intact 
then he can file a suit for permanent prohibitory injunction, uh, restraining the person, the defendant, from trespassing into your property and then uh, what you call dispossessing you from the property. So there are the pleadings, essential pleadings, um, as all of us know, that there must be a, an affirmation as to the possession of the plaintiff, how he came into possession, uh, what are the indications of his possession. For example, if he is residing in a house in the property or if he is taking income from the use of from the property. So these are all indications of possession. So that he will have to plead. And then he may not produce evidence along with the pleading, but then he will have to plead in, in clear terms as to what is the fundamental basis on which he claims injunction against the defendant. So that is one rule of pleading in order six rule two. Then coming to uh, then uh, rule four in order six says particulars to be given where necessary, where the particulars of uh, this thing uh, that is fraud and due influence. Likewise, there is a threat of injunction. Uh, there is a threat, sorry, there is a threat of trespass, then you should make a mention as the defendant is was trying to trespass into your property. That is why you are approaching the court for a quietimate injunction. So that pleading must be there. Then uh, other aspects, I am not uh, going into order 6 uh, in detail. Then coming to order 7, as you are aware, uh, the, the immobile property should be properly described. If it's a suit relating to immobile property, Injunction suit is relating to removal property, then the property should be described properly. So that uh, the, the fundamental principle is that there cannot be an evasive injunction, unclear injunction, obfuscated injunction is impossible. It must be clear in terms because the, the, there is a penal consequence following for the alleged uh, disobedience of injunction as provided in order, that, order 21 rule 32. Because the party can be put in prison or he, this, he can be murdered with the uh, what you call this uh, monetary consequences. So injunction orders and decrees must be very clear for which the materials should be supplied in the pleadings. Then uh, in the case of written statement in a suit for injunction, the principles uh, mentioned in order eight relating to written, sta written statements in all suits are applicable here. Suppose there is an assertion by one party that I am in possession of the property, the defendant is trying to trespass upon my property, and the defendant wanted to deny the plaintiff's possession, then it must be denied in clear terms. It cannot be uh, what you call, you cannot have an evasive denial which is prohibited under order 8 rule 4, and specific denial is required under order 8 rule 5. So these are the fundamental rules regarding pleadings, which may be uh, uh, what you call which may be looked into in injunction suits as well, just like any other suits. So the compliance of order six, order seven, order eight are mandatory in the matter of pleadings. <clears throat> then, <laughs> now there are different suits, kinds of suits possible uh, in this uh, subject. For example, now suppose, let us take permanent prohibitory injunction which is in the nature of a, what you call, a, uh, it is in the nature of uh, prohibiting someone or forbidding someone from doing an illegal act. So it can be in different ways. Now, uh, as you are aware, suppose the plaintiff, when I'm speaking about immobile property suits for the time being, we'll go to the other suits later. Take a case of a suit relating to immobile property where the plaintiff claims that he is in possession of the property by virtue of a title. So he has to establish in his pleadings or he'll have to set out in his pleadings as to how he obtained title to the property. So he must mention the, the, the derivation of title. He must have to say that this was purchased by him or this was gifted to him or he obtained the property uh, pursuant to a will, whatever it is, his title. How did he uh, obtain title to the property and how he can see, of course, when there is title, if the title holder was in possession of the property, it is very easy for the title holder to hand over possession to the assignee. Now, suppose the title holder was not in possession. He was only, uh, he was uh, holding the property only on title, but somebody else was in possession. Then the plaintiff who claims right from such a person will have to establish that I got title from this person and I got possession of the property either uh, by act of parties or through operation of law. Suppose, let us take a case where the plaintiff 
claims title by virtue of a gift deed from his father. One example I am telling you. He obtained a uh, gift from his father and the father was not in possession of the property. The property was outstanding in the possession of a tenant at the time of making the gift. So the plaintiff can only have a symbolic possession of the property because as a, as a donor, he gets only the, uh, the right to possess, not actual cast possession. Suppose the tenant in that case uh, asserts a hostile title, then the plaintiff cannot simply file a suit for injunction against him because admittedly he is a tenant under the donor who is the father of the plaintiff. So he has you have to make he will have to take steps for recovery of possession as well. So a suit for prohibitory injunction may not be maintainable in such case even if he has title to the property. So what I am trying to tell you is that you know, in all suits, in all, in all, in all claims where the plaintiff asserts that he is having title to the property, it may not be possible to claim prohibitory injunction because what is important in a suit for injunction, prohibitory injunction, is that the plaintiff is in possession of the property as on the date of suit. So unless he is able to plead and establish his title, as well as the title through which he claims possession, and if he is uh, and if he satisfies the court that he is in possession of the property on the date of suit, then only his entitlement to claim, claim prohibitory injunction would arise. So that is the fundamental issue. Now, let us take the other issue. Suppose he is not asserting title. He simply says that I am in possession of the property for long years. I may not have title. I have no claim of title, but then I am in possession, excluding the entire world from possession. I am holding the property in possession. Now, if that is so, if that is his claim, then certainly he'll have to uh, narrate all the aspects in his pleadings as to how long he is in possession, whether it is a peaceful possession or whether it is a, what you call some a sporadic act of acquiring possession. Uh, if he is in peaceful possession, certainly he is entitled to seek injunction against the defendant because injunction can be viewed as an injury. Uh, sorry, uh, trespass can be viewed as an injury to the uh, right of possession. So any trespasser who is intending to trespass upon property can be prevented by a quiet injunction if the plaintiff pleads and establishes that he is in peaceful possession of the property for a considerable long time. Now, there is one proposition of law. Uh, suppose a person uh, without asserting title claims that he is in possession of the property for long time and the true owner may be someone else. To the knowledge of the true owner, if he is keeping possession, the plaintiff is keeping possession without title, and the title holder comes forward to trespass upon the property, asserting that I have title, you have no title, though you may have possession, I will not allow you to keep possession, I will trespass upon your property. Suppose such a stand is taken by the title holder, then the person in peaceful possession for long time can file a suit for prohibitory injunction even against the true owner, that is the principle. Of course, there was a difference of divergence of opinion, but now there are by, by so many decisions, it has been settled that uh, an injunction suit can be filed by a person in peaceful possession or in settled possession. The word used in the decision is settled possession. Settled possession is not, it's not a, a sporadic act. Today morning, I trespass and tomorrow I file a suit. That is not a settled possession. Suppose I hold the property for three years or five years un, unchallenged uh, without any challenge. Then, of course, I, am, I, am, I can be said to be in settled possession. In that event, even I, I, I can even maintain a suit against the true owner for injunction. If anybody is interested in a decision, you may please refer to 2004-1 SEC 769. 2004-1 SEC 769. And uh, these principles have been stated in as early as in 1924. A year 1924 Privy Council 144. A year 1924 PC 144. And uh, you will find in Casey Alexander's case, that is A year 1968 Supreme Court 1165. A year 68 Supreme Court 1165. So the, the proposition that I'm trying, of course, there is a Conrad decision on this point. That is 94, 1994, volume 5 SEC 547. 1994, 5 SEC 547, which says, that a person in possession cannot file a suit for injunction against a true owner. That, that, anyway, that has been deviated in 2004-1 SEC 769 
later also this decision 2004 one scc 769 was followed in other decisions as well so now the position is that a, a plaintiff without title if he is in peaceful possession and if he is in settled possession for a long time then he can maintain a suit for injunction even against the true owner the remedy of the true owner is only to get the property recovered by filing a suit for recovery of possession on the strength of his title till then the plaintiff uh, the the he may be a trespasser but anyway he has been in possession for long time so the the possessory right of the plaintiff will have to be protected that is what the decision say so that is maybe an, an extra that's an extraordinary situation probably then recently the supreme court has uh, uh, speaking through uh, justices uh, justice nageshwar rao and justice gavai rendered a decision where it has been held not a not a new proposition but it has been restated that uh, when there is a title dispute a suit for proprietary injunction simpliciter is not maintainable now when the plaintiff himself admits or if the defendant establishes that there is a uh, dispute relating to the title to the property over which an injunction decree is sought for then a simple suit for injunction may not lie because the plaintiff will have to seek a declaration of his title as well as as a consequential relief under section 34 of the specific relief act you have to claim a consequential relief for prohibitory injunction so when there is a dispute when there is a question of title dispute or rather disputed question of title then the remedy of the plaintiff is not a simple suit for injunction but a suit for declaration and consequential injunction so these are the two aspects of prohibitory injunction in respect of immobile property in all other cases there is a larger bench decision by the kerala high court that was uh, reported in 1979 kerala law times klt in short uh, 1979 klt 766 that is reported in ar also and uh, manupatra also have the same citation where the question of kerala land reforms act was considered some questions in the land reforms act was considered where the uh, question was whether a, in a suit for injunction a reference to the special body called land tribunal is required or not where the fuller bench of the kerala high court held that in a suit for injunction simpliciter what is to be decided is only whether the plaintiff is in possession of the property as on the date of suit so all other questions are extraneous in a suit for injunction simpliciter on the basis of possession so 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 let us conclude this uh, discussion by saying that in a prohibitory injunction suit if the plaintiff claims injunction relief on the assertion of his title then certainly he have to plead and establish that he has got title and consequently has got possession over the property through a particular title then he then he can succeed suppose he claims uh, uh, possession only without claiming title then uh, applying the principle in 79 klt 766 the plaintiff has to establish that he is in possession of the property as on the date of suit and if the defendant in the suit for injunction is the true owner and if the plaintiff who is a wrongdoer or who came into possession of the property long prior to the litigation and he is in a settled possession settled possession then of course he can maintain a suit for injunction even against the true owner provided he is not a sporadic trespasser so these are the principles relating to uh the uh, injunction suits in respect of immobile properties where possession is involved so the pleadings uh, in this case as i told you earlier the rules in order 6 order 7 order 8 in the case of written statement will have to be clearly adhered to and all these aspects will have to be pleaded uh, uh, whether he claims title and how he obtained title how he was put in possession if he is not in possession he let, he can't file a suit for injunction his remedy is to get a file a suit for declaration and recovery of possession whatever it is in that manner it goes so then coming to mandatory injunctions in respect of i'm dealing with immobile property for the time being in respect of immobile property uh, section 38 deals with specifically fact section 38 deals with perpetual injunction when granted subject to the other provisions contained in or referred to by this chapter a perpetual injunction may be granted to the plaintiff to prevent the breach of an obligation existing in his favor whether expressly or by implication that is what the section says then coming to mandatory injunction that is 39 section 39 when to prevent the breach of an obligation it is necessary to compel the performance of certain acts which the court is capable of enforcing the court may in its direct discretion 
grant an injunction to prevent the breach complained of and also to compel performance of the requisite acts. So this is the principle of, uh, we have seen that this, this is an affirmative injunction, and if the injunction is an affirmative injunction, suppose a person uh, has uh, demolished a compound wall, took two owners, adjacent owners, their properties are separated by a compound wall. Suppose uh, the uh, one, one person on the northern side demolishes a, the compound wall, and the southern side property owner is aggrieved by the conduct, then he can file a suit against the northern owner by asking him to reconstruct the ward in its original position uh, at his expense. Now, that is called a man. He will be compelled to do a thing. Now, this, these are all actually uh, akin to our writ proceedings in the two, Article 226 or Article, of course, 32 mainly deals with the fundamental rights. But in Article 226, you have this prohibition and uh, mandamus Prohibition is almost akin to this principles in the prohibitive injunction aspect. And mandamus, of course, in the form of mandatory injunction where there is a command to do a particular thing. So, a mandatory injunction is normally claimed when a person has uh, caused violation of the plaintiff's right and restoration of his condition, of his position is required. And if the person is uh, re refusing to restore the plaintiff, then his remedy is to approach a court for mandatory injunction. So the principle of 39, as in the case of prohibitory injunction, the rule of pleadings is the same because then you will have to plead as to what is your right, how, how is it affected or what is the injury caused to your rights, uh, what are the wrongdoings of the defendant and uh, what is the extent of, uh, what you call, what is the extent of restoration or rather a reparative injunction that you are expecting from the hands of the court. So the pleadings and the reliefs must be very clear. So the, the molding of relief is very important because if you omit something, that will be an incomplete package. And uh, as you are aware, this execution is only as provided in Order 21, Rule 32. Maybe disobedience of uh, temporary injunction, Order 39, uh, Rule 2A is there, of course. That's a different aspect, which we, we are not concerned for the time being. No, Art 21 Rule 32 deals with the uh, this uh, enforcement of injunction decrees, but uh, to some extent there are some decisions which say that uh, even a prohibitory injunction can be enforced. Suppose the mischief was done during the interregnum of the suit, it can be enforced. There is a line of decisions. Anyway, it is very difficult unless the decree is specific, unless the decree is clear. Uh, it may be difficult at the time of execution to uh, or untenable claims may arise at the time of execution to avert or to avoid that it is always better to have a clear pleading and uh, the relief must be claimed distinctly then coming to other forms of now we have seen the immobile property suits where plaintiff is in having title and possession he'll have to set all these details if he is only having possession then he'll have to trace his possession from some lawful origin and if he is in settled possession for a long time, even the plaintiff can even claim a relief of injunction, prohibitory injunction against the uh, title holder. And in the case of mandatory injunction, what is the breach committed by the defendant and how are you affected by the breach are the matters to be pleaded. And the relief must be claimed distinctly, very clearly, without any ambiguity. <clears throat> then. Then coming to, now suppose, let us take another type of injunction suit possible. Suppose a person uh, grants license in favor of another, say for doing something, for example, in the form of a, what do you call it, a permission to stay in a house. It's not a lease, something lesser than a lease, it's only license. Now the principle in, in the Indian Eastman's Act, if you refer to section 52 onwards of 262, you will find that a licensee is not in possession of the property because the provisions of 108 of the TP Act is not applicable to licenses because there is no transfer of property involved. So licensee is only in occupation of the property, is not in possession of the property. So in theory, the plaintiff who is a licensor can claim that he is in possession of the licensed property despite the fact that the defendant who is a licensee occupies the property. So the word possession and occupation are different concepts in law. So a, a licensor uh, complaining that after termination of the license, you are aware that the license can be terminated normally 
if it if it does not fall within section 60 of the easements act all other licenses except those falling under section 60 can be terminated at the sweet will and pleasure of the licensor so suppose the licensor terminates the license and uh, ask the licensee to vacate the property uh, immobile property after termination of license if he refuses to do so within a reasonable time provided by the statute uh, then the remedy of the uh, the aggrieved licensor is to file a suit for mandatory injunction requesting the court to send the defendant who was a licensee at one point of time whose license had has been terminated he shall not continue there or occupy there he may be sent out so that is one suit possible so there is there need not be a recovery suit for recovery of possession because the licensee is not in possession of the property but the position uh, becomes different suppose the licensee despite termination of license refuses to leave property for an unreasonable time because reasonable time the statute provides easements act provides reasonable time for the licensee to remove his uh, fixtures from the property suppose an immobile property license for example a cinema theater or a, a rice mill or something like that given on license suppose he has erected fixtures the licensee should get a reasonable time to remove the uh, fixtures the, uh, affixed by them that is why the statute provides a reasonable time suppose the licensee does not vacate the premises even within the reasonable time then the remedy of the plaintiff or the, the licensor is only to file a suit for recovery of possession if he if the licensee assumes the character of a trespasser now that's a different issue not covered by injunction release the remedy is to file a suit under section 9 Red with Section Five of the uh, Specific Relief Act, Section Nine CPC. Red with Section Five of the Specific Relief Act. So a license after what I am trying to tell you is that after termination of a license, normally license in respect of immobile property, uh, the plaintiff can suit uh, file a suit for mandatory injunction on the legal assumption that the licensee is not in possession of the property; he is only in occupation of the property, and this occupation becomes illegal. The after after expiry after expiry of the reasonable time allowed by the statute to vacate from the property so that is another set of uh, suits possible where where the pleadings must be the same because when was the license granted what are the terms of the license when was it revoked and uh, despite uh, intimating the revocation he has not moved out of the license premises so these are the essential matters to be pleaded then another see because there are umpteen uh, uh, types of suits possible uh, claiming injunction release because that's a very long list i may not be possible for me to cover all those aspects in this time so there are lot of suits possible like for example preventing a defamation suppose somebody is uh, bent upon defaming the plaintiff or about to publish an article defaming the plaintiff he can file a suit for injunction prohibitory injunction restraining him from uh, what you call publishing any defamatory article against him but after defamation then the it's not a quatimat action because it has all wrong has already been done so after defamation his remedy is only to file a criminal complaint or to file a suit for damages so before publication of a defamatory statement probably an uh, this prohibitory injunction suit can be filed then uh, then uh, it's a common uh, this uh, what you call feature in the state of kerala where you, in any other state for that matter you will find that uh, suppose there is an agreement to assign property immobile property uh, and uh, the 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 vendee the purchaser may be put in possession or he may be he may not be inducted into possession whatever it may be suppose one of the parties to the agreement to assign immobile property is about to commit a breach by either uh, by a, the suppose the vendor is not uh, he is trying to sell the property for a higher price to another person in contravention of the agreed terms then the remedy of the purchaser intending purchaser or the vendee is to file a suit for injunction prohib seeking prohibitory injunction against the vendor from assigning the property to a third person in violation of the contract but there are certain decisions where say where it is stated that when a specific relief is claimable when the when it is time for example suppose there is a contract i'll just explain that suppose there is a contract where the uh, time agreed to per, agreed for performance is 6 months say so advance amount paid within 6 months the balance has to be paid then there there after the vendor will have to execute a, a deed of conveyance in the name of the vendee if that is his stipulation suppose after 3 months 
I advance was accepted by the vendor after three months, within six months. Suppose he is trying to alienate the property, then an injunction suit can be filed because this is a premature action in respect of present performance is concerned. It is too early because time fixed is not completed. So that is one way of it looking at. Suppose the, the intended uh, alienation is after six months, then the remedy of the vendee is not to file a probability injunction suit, but to file a suit for special performance of the contract along with a prior for prohibitory injunction or temporary injunction under order 39. Now that is the distinction there. Then another question probably is the right of injunction against co-owners. No, injunction cannot be as a rule claimed by one co-owner against the other co-owner. The obvious reason is that each co-owner is presumed under law to be the owner of every inch of property and every co-owner is presumed to be in possession for and on behalf of other co-owners. So injunction taken as a what you call a violation of possessory rights can't be claimed by one co-owner against the other co-owner for the simple reason that they are supposed to be in joint possession. The legal, the, the presumption of law is that e each corner is in possession for and on behalf of other corner as well. But there may be situations where one corner uh, can file a suit for injunction against entry or trespass or ousting the possessing corner. That is possible in theory when the corner plaintiff or the plaintiff corner asserts in his pleadings that he came into possession of the cornership property and he does not deny the rights of other corners, but he was put in possession by other corners to maintain the property, to keep up the property. Then if he is try, if the other corners try to push him out of the property, then he can file a suit for a prohibitory injunction, seeking that other corners may not send me out of the property because I am not a trespasser. I don't deny their rights. I have been put in possession by an agreement or by an arrangement between the corners and I, I am even liable to pay profits, share of profits to the other person because I am in possession. Suppose I, am, I have been sent out of the property, then I will be having a liability to pay profits as well as I will be out of possession. So there will be double uh, what you call bolt, bolt for me. So please uh, grant injunction against the other corners from forcefully evicting me from the property is theoretically possible. But very rarely such situation arise. But then in theory it is possible. Uh, as we find in suits for partition, when there is a claim for partition, normally there will be some corners in possession and some will be out of possession. So if one corner in possession uh, is, uh, try, is, uh, is sought to be evicted from the property during the pendency of the litigation, he can find a suit for, he can file an application for temporary injunction in the same suit, in the suit for partition, saying that, no, I am in possession of the property as a corner. Or rather, I, I say that I am in possession of the property denying their rights, whatever it is. And I may not be forcefully evicted because this suit has to be decided whether partition is to be granted or not, to what extent is a matter to be decided in the suit. Till then, I may be allowed to continue. Such a stand is legally possible. Then, another type of injunction between corners is injunction against commission of waste. Waste means it can be demolition of buildings can be cutting and removing trees or it can be excavating soil from the property. So any act which reduces the value of the property, ownership property, is an actionable wrong. Suppose the plaintiff says that as a corner, I am entitled to property along with the defendants and the defendants are trying to commit waste in the property or damage something there which will affect my ownership, right? So please restrain them by a prohibitory injunction from committing waste, that is also a, a, a sort of injunction that can that can be claimed by corner by one corner against the other corner. So normally, if we start by saying that the injunction between corners is not generally allowed because each person is presumed to be owner of the property, but then in exceptional circumstances, it is possible to claim injunction by one corner against the other corner if these conditions are satisfied. Then. A quick uh, uh, this aspect about temporary injunctions because now coming to order 39 CPC, uh, the temporary injunctions are generally claimed for preserv preservation of the property in dispute till the uh, dispute is finally resolved or till the adjudication is uh, 
till the rights are adjudicated properly, the property status of the property should be preserved. Or maintenance of status quo ante is the reason for claiming a temporary injunction. It varies from facts to facts. In a suit for partition, normally the claim for temporary injunction will be against commission of waste. In a suit for uh, uh, injunction against trespass, will be that uh, the party should be directed to maintain status quo. The effect of injunction is to maintain status quo and uh, the court will decide as to whether the plaintiff is in possession of the property as on the date of suit. Suppose the defendant trespasses in the meantime, the plaintiff will be compelled to alter the nature of the suit to one for recovery of possession. So that will be a, a cumbersome procedure no? that will incur cost for the plaintiff as well as it's a time consuming exercise. So just to prevent that, the court can uh, pass a temporary injunction order virtually directing the defendant to maintain status quo ante of the property. That is uh, that is the purpose of order 39, uh, order, the rules in the order 39. Then, so generally speaking, uh, injunction reliefs are of two types. One is affirmative, which is in the form of mandatory injunction. The other is prohibitive, which is in the form of uh, permanent prohibitory injunction and the other quiet and injunction is always presumed to be a quiet imminent action and uh, uh, once the wrong has been done there is no question of granting a prohibitory injunction because then the question of restoration happens and the pleadings essential pleading says suppose the plaintiff claims injunction on the basis of title and possession then he'll have to set out the uh, the the documents or the 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 channel through which he obtained title and how he came into possession and uh, the materials to establish that he is in possession of the property shall also be produced uh, either at, along with the pleadings or before the start of evidence. Then uh, in the case of uh, other mandatory injunction also, you will have to set out what is the wrong committed by the defendant, what is the injury suffered by him, to what extent it should be restored, how it has to be restored. And in all suits for injunction, uh, as in the case of all suits, especially in injunction suits, the pleadings must be specific with, with, with regard to the rights and the apprehended danger or with regards to the rights and the committed wrong. And also it must be very clear in terms regarding the reliefs that are claimed because omission of release will be fatal uh, in, the manner of ex in the matter of execution of injunction decrees. So these are the bird's eye view of the uh, injunction reliefs claimable and the general rules of pleadings. Now, I think, Mr. Vikash, we will uh, go for this. Uh, if there is any question, probably I can clear that. Mr. Vikash? I think uh, yes, sir. 40, 45 minutes uh, so that I will keep my time. Yeah. Uh, here we haven't received any message. Uh, I will just check it on the YouTube. Okay. No, sir. I think you have, yeah, only one. Can, uh, this is? Just can, can, can the transpose, what is that question? Probably I did not see the question. Can a person be transposed? Can injunction grant not transpose a plaintiff as a defendant? No, injunction suit, it is not possible because there are rival interests or competing interests. It's not possible to plain trans, no, it, see, not possible, not in that sense. Maybe it may be possible in say, for technical reasons. Suppose A claims injunction relief against B, saying that B is trying to trespass upon my property. There is no question of transposing B in A's position because their interests are different. They are conflicting. But suppose A and B together file a suit for injunction and uh, uh, against C and D. D files a written statement supporting the claim of A and B. Then probably in the absence of B or A, a, B, D can be transposed depending on the nature of pleadings and the positions that they take. It can be decided. Normally, it is not possible to transpose, and not in the case as in the case of a partition. This is not such a type because the conflicting interest may arise. If that, if there is a conflict in interest, they can't be transposed. Uh, uh, can injunction be used to cancel fraudulent documents? Injunction can't be used for cancel uh, cancelling fraud and document because there is a specific provision in this specifically fact for cancellation of instruments. That is section 31, if I remember correctly. So one minute, please. Yes, 31. That is falling under chapter 7. Sorry, chapter 5. Cancellation of instruments specifically deals with uh, uh, this uh, uh, cancellation of instruments. That is documents. 31 to 33. 
deal with those aspects and injunction is not a remedy for cancellation of a document yeah, yeah then anti pillar order please explain it sir anton pillar order anton pillar or anti suit i don't know what exactly is that can and he will explain it again umesh says what uh, what temporary injunction in mand in mandatory form no the question should be question is not very clear but i'll try to answer this question because in generally speaking mandatory injunction relief uh, temporary mandatory injunction relief cannot be or shall not be granted is the general rule but only in exceptional circumstances it can be granted because mandatory injunction relief are directing a party to do a particular thing or restore the plaintiff's right now for that it has to be adjudicated and decided that the plaintiff has such a right and the defendant has violated his right so before adjudicating properly it is unfair to grant a mandatory injunction in the temporary injunction form mandatory relief in the temporary injunction form so normally the courts are reluctant to grant a, a temporary mandatory injunction because the courts are not equipped with uh, sufficient materials to decide whether there is any infringement of the plaintiff's rights but in the case of a prohibitory injunction the position is different virtually prohibitory injunction is only to see that the 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 status quo ante of the property is kept so there is no that much danger but in the case of a temporary mandatory injunction suppose a situation has been asked to be undone by the defendant suppose the plaintiff has no right in the ultimate trial if it is found that he has no such right then the defendant will be put to prejudice so normally the courts are reluctant to grant a uh, mandatory injunction in the interim form yeah what is the difference between temporary injunction and a mandatory injunction no that question appears no, to be temporary injunction and ad interim injunction temporary injunction means ah uh, that is ad interim order of injunction if you read uh, order 39 just one minute i'll explain that there is a confusion among lot of lawyers over that order 39 Order thirty nine, rule one to uh, three, etc. If you read those provisions, it is clear that the temper what is referred to therein is only temporary injunction. But temporary injunction, as we understand from this provision, is the injunction that is granted on an application filed along with a suit for injunction or any other suit for that matter, for claiming injunction till the disposal of the suit. That is called temporary injunction. Any injunction granted after hearing both sides. after hearing the uh, after considering the affidavit filed in support of the injunction application and it's also on the counter affidavit filed by the respondent defendant and the court after hearing both sides an order of injunction is passed and that will continue till the disposal of the suit unless it is reversed in appeal so such orders are called temporary injunctions ad interim order of injunction is that the normal rule is notice is because you are aware caveat can be filed under 148 a even if no caveat is filed the normal rule is that temporary injunction shall be granted only in exceptional circumstances if the plaintiff establishes a prima facie case and the balance of convenience is in his favor and the he will suffer irreparable injury if temporary injunction is not granted these are the three parameters for grant of injunction one prima facie case second thing balance of convenience third thing uh, whether injury will be suffered by the plaintiff if these three things are established the plaintiff is entitled to get temporary injunction but if that is to be given in an ad interim form without hearing the defendant the plaintiff will have to establish a strong case in the plain as well as he will have to produce the relevant documents to show that his uh, he has a prima facie case then only the court can pass an ad interim order of injunction and that ad interim order of injunction will be in force until the defendant appears and he shows that the injur- injunction order passed by the court is incorrect if that is uh, uh, established by the defendant the the sudden interim order can be vacated and the temporary injunction application can be dismissed so the point is temporary injunction is a relief which is granted to a plaintiff till the disposal of the suit ad interim order of injunction is a relief granted to the plaintiff till the disposal of the application for temporary injunction i think that will help lot of people to understand the uh, yes fi- final subtle difference between the two yes yes and this is a normal call he says what is your feeling that why temp- uh, this is on the youtube why temporary injunction is put in cpc and not in the specific relief act 
no temporary injunction is only a procedural matter because it is it is flowing out of section 94 cpc section 94 cpc deals with so many supplementary proceedings supplementary proceedings in cpc are intended to see that a, a suit while a suit is pending uh, so there, there may be occasions or there may be situations where the court will have to guard the rights of the parties and uh, it will be kept intact for, till the final adjudication so temporary injunction is only you know assume i will explain it in another way suppose in a case the plaintiff succeeds uh, in getting a temporary injunction after taking evidence after hearing uh, parties and after perusing the documents why court finds that uh, the suit is um, the suit is to be dismissed because the plaintiff has no case he has not established a ground for prohibitory injunction then he can dismiss the suit so not for the reason that temporary injunction is granted he need not decree the suit so temporary injunction is only till the disposal of the suit and that is not a part of specific relief act which provides final rights of the parties the temporary injunction is only a procedural aspect for the uh, for the court to adopt till the disposal of the suit that is why this is not mentioned in specific relief act the last question we will take bill of possession based on fraud documents be considered as a dual possession pardon question please once more uh, i will reframe can a possession based on fraud uh, fraudulent documents be framed uh, be considered as a adverse possession no adverse possession you need not look into document the adverse possession theory if you refer to article 65 of the uh, limitation act or section 27 for that matter limitation act no adverse possession is a factor is a thing which has to be established by showing that you are in possession of the property uninterruptedly nec why nec clamp nec procureo with a hostile animus for 12 years and ex with an intention to exclude the entire world and you are in possession may be a wrongful possession so that is the element of adverse possession it need not be by through a fraudulent document even without a document a person can trespass so there is no uh, nexus between having a fraudulent document and adverse possession adverse possession is a right uh, is a wrong against the possessory right for which there is no need of a document so whether there is a valid document or a wrong document or a fraudulent document it doesn't matter if the if the person in adverse possession person asserting adverse possession shows that he is in possession of the property adverse to the true owner for more than 12 years and he has uh, a hostile animus to exclude all the world from possession so relevancy of a fraudulent document or not doesn't affect the claim of adverse possession because it's a wrong against possession after the restoration of suit whether the injunction granted earlier uh, does it come into existence automatically or not no it doesn't come into existence that is the settled law now because once the suit for injunction is restored uh, this the all the interim orders will go so oh, upon restoration is upon restoration upon restoration automatic restoration is not possible suppose there is a change of circumstances if the defendant is able to show that uh, suppose the suit is dismissed and it was lying dismissed for 6 months now uh, suppose let us take a situation where the suit is uh, the suit is for specific performance of contract and there is a temporary injunction order saying that uh, the you shall not sell the property to another person except to the uh, the, the plaintiff and that is the order passed suppose the, the time stipulated for contract is only 6 months on the fifth month or, or or on the completion of immediately after 6 months such a suit is filed the suit for specific performance was dismissed for default and it lied uh, there for one year and in the meantime the period agreed to between the parties elapsed so merely by restoration can this be done that is the question no two views are possible but predominantly this is the view yeah. so what is marvia marvia injunction what is it marvia injunction not familiar with that term actually. i also never heard no, m a r v uh, i v a no maybe some uh, local usage i don't know i'm not that so sorry and then is without extension of order of injunction how many days will it be in force no without extension means the, the order passed by the court must be clear whether it is for one month or two month or till the disposal of the suit or till the, the disposal of the application it must be made clear in the order itself no but we take he is taking cue from that asian reconstruction just to the ah, asian asia reconstruction correct no then not more than say after 6 months it is vacated after because normally months. originally it was not there now he okay. intending to say that Right. Wherein normally we are coming to the high court, stating therein that the stay be granted. Right. Let's no, assume it is granted in the civil division sector. Correct, correct, correct. No, that is because that is probably that's a direction to high courts, not to the trial courts. Because trial, no, trial courts. courts also we are experiencing that 
lot of civil regions and or uh, let's assume it's a quashing then also they say get the extension granted from the high court uh-huh. there's a quashing state in anyway, the asia restructure has been reiterated by just just kem joseph and other bench this is sanjay kishan kohli if i remember that has yeah. been reaffirmed in a later decision of the supreme court they said that you have to act in uh, stricto sensu with that judgment yes no that is probably to avoid uh, the difficulty of what you call once grant an order then it will continue there even if the other side moves for vacating it nobody takes up just to avoid that situation probably that is the reason for that decision yeah. so the last question by a, uh, p chandrashekar a created a sale agreement relating to the b property by c and filed a suit against c and attached the property can b join the suit to claim his right over the property a filed a suit against a filed a, what is so the last question? question you can see on the chat box chat box one minute one minute He created a sale agreement relating to B property by C, uh, and filed a suit against C. And he created sale agreement relating to B property by C, and filed a suit against C. And that can be. Actually, the question is not very clear. I, I, so I understand what from the question I understand. A created a sale agreement. But with... Naveen has also written the question is not very clear. And uh-huh. same I will say about S M Karda. He says, "What is Marbi injunction and Anton Pillar order injunction?" Sorry, At least sorry. I haven't heard these words. I I also have not heard these words. I can't answer the question. Sorry. I thought probably in the south we have those words. At no, least no, in the north. No, no, no. This is actually from where this question has come. I don't. S M Adhar. Adhar. Okay, okay. I'm not. I'm sorry. I can't answer that question. I don't know what exactly. Okay. Shall we stop then? He's That's saying uh, somebody has explained. He says a court order which restrains someone from removing or dealing with their assets. This can be by way of an interim order and is referred to as a freezing injunction. These were formerly known as uh, Marvi injunctions, a form of injunction. Okay, maybe. Anyway, that's not a familiar term for me. Yeah. At least in this state, we don't use such expressions. Yeah, Naveen says it's in a Ashok Kumar case where Anton uh, Pillar has been explained. Okay. So I will ask S M Kada to read that, or before uh, till we conclude, uh, Naveen can post that judgment on the board. Oh, thank, thank you, you, friends. And it was quite engaging session by Justice Harry Prasad, and it was truly true to his name that we all enjoyed the Prasad of knowledge, and and that too from Harry. That's the best way to see his third innings. blossoming well everyone stay safe stay blessed shivaji datta says anton pillar order is used for trademark cases which ah, enables for surprise search of premises ah correct correct anton pillar that's it in terms of trademark of course oh, yeah please right yes. that is where you do more of the ip or a trademark cases ah, okay, okay that is generally in the metro cities okay yeah thank you everyone uh, thank you for safe. the opportunity vikas So we, keep on, we will keep on looking you upon oh, you and uh, bothering sure, you. Sure. Thank you. It's my it's my pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. And all the best for your new innings. Thank you. Thank you.